This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you Episode 22 of Season 2 of the Westford Wardsman Podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, May 29th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago as we read. The first section is the About Town section. Samuel L. Taylor had peas in blossom May 27th. This means peas for dinner June 10th, two days earlier than air before, and all those farmers in the Stony Brook Valley who have been in the contest are now beaten. He invites to dine on green peas on the above date. But don't be too hungry, for he is likely to have more sympathy for you than the peas. Get ready for next spring's contest. The early morning feature of Memorial Day will be a ball game at Railroad Park near Westford Station between the Westford team and the Matthews of Lowell, who have the reputation of being the fastest team in this vicinity, and the Westford boys have got to get one of their old-time movements with a high and elastic spring to it to get round before the experienced team from Lowell do. The game will be called at 9 a.m. and finish in in season for the exercises at the hall. The school committee have appointed John A. Taylor to take the school census. The railroad hearing is the next section. The selectmen, town council, and a liberal number of representative citizens of the town attended the hearing of... in Boston before the railroad commissioners last Tuesday in a remonstrance against the rise in fare from Westford to Brookside. Edward Fisher, counsel for the town, opened the case for the remonstrance and gave a clear and comprehensive statement of the history of the Electric Railway Company from its franchise until the present time. From this view, it appears that the railway company have done as they pleased. They have kept promises and broken promises and changed plans as it suited them, not as it suited the town. The main line, the main line was planned to go through Westford Center. This they failed to fulfill. Then down the Groton Road let us go, and we will take care of Westford Center by building a spur from Graniteville and another spur from the Groton Road to Brookside. This they failed to fulfill. What next? Let us out of the spur from Graniteville up to the center, and we will take care of you by extending the spur from Brookside Brookside up to the center. And the town let them off, and after a good many efforts at lassoing them, they were finally tamed into a manageable condition and reluctantly fulfilled this last agreement. That is, they built the spur from Brookside to the center. And to pay the citizens of Westford for enforcing this agreement, they raised the fare to the point that is higher than anything in the state, hence this hearing to remonstrate. Lawyer Brooks opened for the company and admitted that a 15-cent fare was exorbitant, but that it was done as an experiment to show that the company could not run either on a 15-cent, 10-cent, or 15-cent fare, that should be 5 cent, 10 cent, or 15 cent fare, to Westford and live. But the spur line as a whole he did not show, and now as ever Brookside is considered as a terminal. He further stated that the company was willing to return to a 10 cent fare, and perhaps lower, but the company could not consider a 6 cent fare on the whole line. It would not be just to the mill help in the villages, as a 5 cent fare is their opportunity for pleasure and recreation. And so far as the company is unable to pay its fixed charges, they have the sympathy of all patrons of the branch line and elsewhere. And this misfortune is not to be sneeringly charged against them in so far as this cripples them in efficiency. But this doesn't seem to be a valid excuse for taxing the citizens of Westford a fair in excess treble what it is on any other part of the line or in the state for that for distance, nor does it excuse the discourteous treatment or refusing a free and open hearing before the citizens, rather than their spirit to take your 15 cent fare on a 24 hours notice. Why single out the citizens of Westford? This question has been asked many times and never answered. Are we such a high and mighty people or so isolated that the outside world have to be charged 15 cents to get a peep at us? 
it is true we are worth looking at even at that price of admission. So that's the um, plight of the citizens of Westford, but no resolution is given as to what the railroad commissioners decided. The next section is the Forge, Bil Forge Village section. The members of the Ladies Sewing Club met with Mrs. Richard D. Prescott Thursday afternoon. Much work was accomplished, and Mrs. Prescott served a lunch of ice cream and cake, after which a short time was spent in a pleasant social. Alvin Bennett and his sister, Mrs. Mary Drake, started Tuesday for Wyawaga, Wisconsin, for a visit to his old home. Mrs. Augustus W. Karkin is confined to the house with a severe attack of muscular rheumatism. About town is the next section. John A. Taylor, who was looking over the wheat fields of Ohio last week, has returned home. He reports the harvest prospects good and secured his prospective share, having accepted the position of instructor of public speaking at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. This is the oldest college west of the Allegheny Mountains. It will celebrate its 100th anniversary in June. Actually, Ohio University in Athens, Ohio, was founded in 1804. And so Miami University, founded in 1809, is the second oldest university in Ohio, and I presume west of the Alleghenies. Heavy frosts were reported in various parts of the town Tuesday night, mostly in the lowlands in the south and west. The shock was not felt in the Stony Brook Valley, and those early peas and sweet corn still continue to wave or the land of the free and the home of the brave. A successful food sale, strawberry and other temptations, was held at the house of Mrs. Abio J. Abbott Thursday afternoon. The proceeds go towards repairs and improvements on the interior of the Unitarian Church. The next section is called a large order. Our over-busy citizen, Daniel H. Sheehan, is double-decked busy just at present, having received an order from the state for 15 million yards of burlap in behalf of the gypsy moth industry. This seems like a large order for the size of a one-horse water power and a one-man power. In addition to this, Mr. Sheehan has come in possession for debt of 19,000 acres of land in Maine, covered with timber, trout brooks, ponds and lakes, and sawmills. Just at present, he is busy tearing down the old wooden mill on Tadmuck Brook, which was erected over 40 years ago by Joshua Decatur. The building has neither been shingled, painted, whitewashed, or carpeted since it was built. For all this, it didn't leak enough last summer to raise good crops. This old building has been occupied for various industries by various parties, first by the owner as a carpenter shop, next by Waldron Brothers of Nash Nelson, New Hampshire, for a wheelwright shop, followed by James Barney of North Chelmsford, who continued the wheel industry. There being too much wheeling for the amount of water wheeling power to make wheels with, he departed on a wheel for elsewhere. For a few years, Hamlet and Brown of Brookside and West Chelmsford opened it as a studio for painting, confined mostly to wagons, sleighs, and wheelbarrows. Then True A. Bean of Westford believed there was money in wheels, and he started to demonstrate it, but he didn't make enough to, well, never mind, guess at it. After a lapse of useful idleness for a season, Fisher and Fifield started in to make brackets and can continue to do so without any racket until the firm was dissolved by an active law of nature with cemetery proceedings. The present owner, Mr. Sheehan, is about to make extensive improvements in the water power, a new cement dam eight feet high with flowage back to Main Street. So get off your huckleberry bushes and cranberry tops before the deluge of modern manufactory leaveth not even a green twig for a dove as in the ancient flood. This, uh, this facility is, is a reference to... Uh, I'm sorry, that, that, that reference is to uh, Noah and the Great Flood described in Genesis uh, chapter 8. The, the land to be moistened by this enterprise included land of John Haley, C.R.P. Decatur, and Charles E. Miller. This is uh, Mr. Sheehan's, what we refer to as cider mill, uh, and his cider mill pond is now surrounded by 39 acres of conservation land that may be accessed off the parking lot on Lowell Road. 
see the uh, Westford Conservation Trust website for more information about uh, there are many trails and this one in particular. The next section is Westford Center. George M. Balch is at his father's home completing the tedious convalescence from typhoid with which he was so ill in Manchester. George's father was Samuel H. Balch, a brother of Waylon Balch, who's frequently mentioned in the Wardsman. Cyrus Hosmer of Wakefield has been a visitor in town this past week, spending part of the time with his granddaughter, Mrs. W.J. Merritt, and the latter part with his daughter, Mrs. W.M. Wright. Cyrus Hosmer was one of the original trustees of the Methodist Church at Graniteville when it was built in 1869. Roadmaster Frank E. Miller and his men have, during the week, been putting this, the, the village streets in fine order previous to Memorial Day. Additional notices have been posted calling for bids for carrying the mail between Westford Depot and the center of the town. Only one was received previously, and that considered too high for consideration. At a meeting of the school board held at the town hall Friday evening, May 21st, the following teachers were e elected for next year for the center. At William E. Frost School, Miss Ruth Fisher, principal, Miss M. L. Grant and Miss Elizabeth Cushing, teachers, assistant at the high school, Miss Gertrude E. Bartlett, teacher of drawing, Mr. Brackett, supervisor of music, Miss Molly Raines of Chelmsford. Uh, Ruth Fisher, Miss Ruth Fisher, is a sister of Edward Fisher, who was mentioned uh, quite often. He's a, a a lawyer in Lowell who was from Westford, and his brother Thomas Fisher was a principal of one of the high schools in uh, Lowell. Memorial exercises is the next section. The Union Memorial Ser Service will be held with the church at Graniteville Sunday. That's the Methodist Church. All the churches in town will unite in this service, and Reverend Philip Armand, pastor of the Graniteville Church, will deliver the sermon. The choirs of our two village churches are practicing to make the musical part of the service one of excellence. Reverends Benjamin H. Bailey and Charles P. Marshall will have part in the conduct of the service. Monday, the veterans and sons of veterans will assemble at the town hall and march to Fairview Cemetery, accompanied by the Nashua Military Band of 25 pieces. The next section is the Grange. The meeting of the Grange at the town hall last week, Thursday evening, was one of profit and pleasure with its large attendance and good program. Charles M. Gardner, lecturer of the Massachusetts, Massachusetts State Grange and member of the legislature, was the speaker of the evening. He has won many friends in this Grange, and his address Thursday evening was full of interest and good sense to his hearers. It was bright and optimistic to a degree, and dwelt upon the unity of the order and its mission of helpfulness and hopefulness to old and young members alike. A hearty vote of thanks was extended to Mr. Gardner at the close of the evening for his excellent address. Resolutions were drawn up to, presented at, to be presented at the street railway hearing the following Tuesday in Boston, and Reverend Charles P. Marshall was appointed to represent the 200 members of the Grange at that hearing. Mrs. John Feeney was appointed chairman of the Feast Committee for Children's Night, June 3rd. There's a, one item about Graniteville. The repair work on Broadway under the supervision of contractor J.A. Healy is now progressing rapidly and when finished will be a source of pleasure to the village and a credit to the town. Next is a section on entertainment. The children of the sergeant school gave that pleasing cantata entitled, quote, the Carnival of Flowers, end quote, in the Methodist Episcopal Church on Tuesday evening, and the entertainment met with great success. The children all did finely, which reflects great credit on the unfailing efforts of the teachers in charge. The whole affair was given under the personal supervision of Edwin N. C. Barnes, the musical instructor in the school. Miss E. Marion Sweat, accompanist. A special attraction, and one that proved to be very pleasing, was the excellent violin selections given by Gunnar A.G. Ekman of Boston. 
Quite a neat sum was realized on this affair, and the money is to be used toward a fund with which to buy a piano for the school building. The following teachers had charge of the children in Tuesday night's performance. Gerald Decatur, Miss Icy Mark Parker, and Miss M.A. Dunn. Uh, next item is entitled Death. Miss T. Judith S. Matson, a well-known young woman of this village, died at her home in West Graniteville on Friday night, May 21st, after a lingering illness, aged 22 years. She was the daughter of Mr. and Mrs. John Matson, and besides her father and mother, she leaves one brother, John, and four sisters, uh, Blenda and Engla, Ruth, and Lily Matson, as well as a wide circle of friends to mourn her loss. Although her death was unexpected, the end came as a severe shock to her many friends here, with whom she was very popular. Miss Matson's illness covered a period of over two years, and although the members of her family were unfailing in their devotion and care of the favorite sister, and the best of medical aid given in the hope that she might regain her lost health, it seemed to be the will of Almighty God to pick this frail flower in the bloom of youth, of young womanhood, and place her among his chosen ones. Uh, apparently she died of tuberculosis. That's the news in Westford for the week ending May 29th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you. <laughs>